the most significant couple of things that I can perhaps say about Bishop Yakel are first, Bishop Yakel ordained me as an elder in 1981 and received me as a full member of the then Western New York Annual Conference. You never forget who ordained you. That connection is forever. Bishop Yakel is my bishop forever. What a privilege it is to have the bishop who ordained you in your residential area. Bishop, I don't forget the moment that you and Lois together visited the church I served, Rochester, New York, and Lisa and I share that as a precious memory that we care, carry. Second, the respect and honor that Bishop Yakel is held by his colleagues on the Council of Bishops. He is one of the bishops whose wisdom and guidance is a sword when there are difficult decisions to be made. He stands as a person of integrity and in-depth knowledge of our church. He is a great person of wisdom and faith. That should not be surprised any one of us. Bishop Yakel is one of us. He was born in Mahanoy City in the cold region of Northeastern Pennsylvania. He is a graduate of Lebanon Valley College. However, his student years were interrupted by a time of service in the military as a member of the prestigious U.S. Navy SEVIS. So he did 200 push-ups. <laughs> Bishop, I will explain you why they laughed at this moment. <laughs> He then matriculated to United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. His pastoral appointments in the former Evangelical United, United Brethren Church included a student pastorate at Gardner's Mount Victory Church, assistant pastor at Hagerstown, pastor at Messiah Church in York, and Memorial Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. Following his service in the pastorate, he then served as the Assistant General Secretary and then General Secretary of Evangelism of the Evangelical United Brethren Church for nine years. In 1972, he was selected, elected uh, by the Northeastern jurisdiction as a bishop. He served the New York West area on, from 1972 until 1984 and then as bishop of the Washington area from 1984 to 1996 when he retired. During his years of episcopacy, Bishop Yaker served 16 years on the General Board of Church and Society and also as the president of the Council of Bishops. His lovely wife and partner in ministry for all of those years was his late wife, Lois. It was the privilege of our conference that she was memorialized during the memorial service during our time together here. He is survived by five children and 12 grandchildren. Bishop Yakel has been living among the people of Susquehanna Conference in re retirement while he cared for Lois. However, he will soon move to Ohio to be near his children and grandchildren in a few days. Our prayers are with him as he makes the needed transition during these days. We are grateful to claim him as one of us and to have him come today and be our preacher for this year's ordination service. Would you please stand and greet Bishop Yakel and extend to him a warm Susquehanna and your conference welcome, our bishop. Will you pray with me? And now, O oh God, either through me or in spite of me, speak to your people. Grant all of us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church and the churches and especially to us on this day of ordination. And having heard, then grant us grace and courage and peace to do that which you would have of us. 
for we pray it in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The main thing is to make the main thing and keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> That's the main thing. <laughs> End of sermon. It's exactly 33 years and three days, sir, and I was privileged to ordain you an elder in the United Methodist Church. You were John Chen Park at that time. You and your wife have been friends and colleagues before and ever since, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. I, I had the, um, well, I don't know whether it was idiosyncrasy or what it was, but I did my own preaching for ordination. I tried to talk your bishop into that this time, but he, he didn't quite give it up. <laughs> and here I am. But you know, the topic at that time, if you don't remember, was marked by eagerness and love and desire. The General Conference had met a year before and had adopted this as the basis for examination of elders. Are they marked by ignorance, ig eagerness, not ignorance, eagerness <laughs> to share the good news? Do they have love for all of God's people? And do they have the desire to serve God? That's not a bad way to get started, is it? And now here it is, 33 years, three days later, and you've already had 10 years of serving as a bishop in the life of the church. My congratulations to you and my thanksgiving for our friendship together. The same year as his ordination, he and Lisa completed five years of citizenship. He was serving a church in the southern part of Rochester, New York. I was not aware of this because I soon learned later on that he was then known as Jeremiah. It was when he became a citizen of this country that he took the name Jeremiah to project his own ambitions and hopes of ministering in, in that tradition. And uh, he has certainly done that in the years in between. And I'm grateful uh, to be a part of this particular occasion. Let me say a word to the ordinands. You know, if, if you have been judged on these three concerns of your desire to uh, be a part of the gospel teaching and your willingness to love all people and all of these other things, then uh, your ordination sets you apart as persons who speak for the United Methodist Church. What you say, what you do, what you don't do will speak loudly in the years ahead. You need no longer wait for the affirmation of the church. This, this is your privilege. You will be permission givers. You will hear accounts of things you've said and done that you didn't know you had said them and done them <laughs> from some. Many of those will be positive, but the risk of it all is that some may be negative, but that's the chance you're willing to take and the chance you need to take. Well, you see, the future of our church is dependent on its leadership. That's why I ask for the scripture reading of the afternoon. If you'll permit me, listen carefully to the expectations 
If I speak in the tongues of human beings and of angels but have, have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge but have not love, I gain nothing. If I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, kind, not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude doesn't insist on its own way, not irritable or resentful, but rejoices, not in the wrong, but rejoices in the right, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for our knowledge, it will pass away, for our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I gave up childish ways for now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part that I shall be fully understood, even as I have been fully known. So faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Therefore, make love your aim. You know, it's a tough time to take on the ministry of the church. We are a divided church right now. No one needed to tell me whether I was a male or female when I was born. It was pretty obvious. And no one needed to tell me that there was a part of me that was attracted to the opposite gender. I don't use the word sex anymore. I talk about gender the same gender, the, the opposite gender, whatever. But it would sound so different if I could get all of you to say so-and-so of the same gender married or fell in love. It, it would be different if we talked about it in that fashion. It's when we talk about sex that we diminish the humanity that we are. God created us in such a fashion that we know and understand who we are and what we are. I, I ask, well, we had, a, we had a gathering of the Council of Bishops shortly after all of this business about same sex blew up. And we had a special presenter, a professor from one of the seminaries come and address us, and we were in a dining room, kind of like this room here, the pulpit or the lectern was in the center, and there were semicircle seats all through it. And, and the president of the council said, if you want to respond to the speech or if you want to ask a question or say something, come and sit in this inner circle. Um, I, I finally went and sat in that inner circle, and he finally came to me. He said, Joe, what, what is it you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to ask I'd like to invite the speaker of the day to come and sit in the circle with me. Well, I could see him out of the side. I, you know, I could look and see. And I, I told him, he was shaking his head, no, 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 no. And, and, and the, the president of the council said, well, I'm sorry, Joe, he isn't willing to come. What's your question? Well, I said, I'd like to have him come and tell me when he chose to be heterosexual. Because so am I, but I've never chosen it. It's a part of my life. What right do I have to say that others chose differently? 
if I didn't choose personally. And so it's a whole new day in which we're trying to find ourselves and give leadership to what's taking place around us. I, I have problems with the way things get treated in, in our life together today. I'd like to ask you a question. What religion was in your soul when you were born? Isn't it strange that God didn't present us with a religion to which we could say yes or no? You know that song from South Pacific, you got to be carefully taught to hate before you're six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You got to be carefully taught. Maybe we need a second verse to that. You got to be carefully taught to love, to love all the people your relatives love. You got to be carefully taught. God did not present a religion in us to say yes or no. And I call that to your attention, my colleagues who are being consecrated and today. You've got to preach. You've got to teach. You've got to witness to your understanding of the vast and great love of God in Christ, to who you are, to who we are together in the full knowledge that we didn't come that way. What would you be if you had been born in another country? Can you imagine that? What a blessing God has given to us. I remember shortly after my election to this office, I came across a statement by the Archbishop of Hippo. They were celebrating the 10th anniversary of his becoming a bishop in the church. He said, for you, I'm a bishop, but with you, I'm a Christian. The first is an office accepted, the second a grace received, one a danger, the other safety. If I'm gladder by far to be received with you than I am to play, be placed over you, I shall, as our Lord commanded, be more faithfully your servant. If you forget anything else I've said, put your own position there. For you, I'm a pastor, but wish you I'm a Christian. The first is an office accepted, the second a grace received. If I'm gladder by far to be received with you than I am to be placed over you, our shall as our Lord commanded, more faithfully your servant. Well, there's a lot of things I'd like to say. And there's a lot of things your bishop would hope I wouldn't say. <laughs> but let me put it this way. I'm going to leave you with a benediction. It's a Franciscan benediction. I wish I could say it's Joe Yackel's benediction, but it isn't. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless you with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand 
to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with foolishness. Foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. The main thing is to make the main thing and keep the main thing the main thing. That's the main thing. Amen.